Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, as you know, this, this event is um, co-sponsored by the um, IP section um, um, and the Copyright Society of the USA. Um, we have uh, two panelists today. It was previously scheduled to be three. Uh, Lisa Moore, unfortunately, did not make it today because of a work emergency. And, um, she certainly wanted to pass along her regrets. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the panelists and just let them get started. Uh, David Struve, who's uh, sitting over here to my left, is a principal at Struve Designs, an award-winning design firm. I'm going to let him say a little bit more about his company because he'll, he'll do a much better job than I will. Uh, Liz Wheeler is an attorney at the Moore Firm, uh, an entertainment and IP boutique firm. She's also an adjunct professor at Savannah College of Art and Design, where she teaches a class on legal issues in the arts. Liz also serves on the executive board of the entertainment and sports law section of the state bar and is the co-chair of the IP committee of the Young Lawyers Division. Uh, Liz regularly speaks um, on entertainment and IP issues, attorneys, law students, artists, arts organizations, um, and has assisted in writing several articles for Matthew Bender entertainment industry contracts, most notably of, of which is a forthcoming article on 3D printing, which is the, uh, obviously the subject matter of today's panel. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to David. I am the owner of Screw Designs. Uh, we are, for the most part, a web design and graphic design firm based out of, out of Swanee. Um, we work mainly with marketing firms and smaller to mid-sub level size uh, corporations, helping them kind of develop their corporate brand identity. Um, but we also do 3D printing for people. Uh, as far as I know, we are the only company in Atlanta that's currently offering 3D printing to kind of the general public. Um, there are a number of people in Atlanta that also have 3D printers, but they don't, they don't market themselves at least, and they don't show up any work for them. Um, let me tell you a little bit about kind of the printer and the process of what's been taking place here. So this specific machine is called the RepRap Prusa. Uh, the term RepRap re refers to uh, uh, replicating rapid prototyping machines. So the machine is, the original principle behind the machine was that it was capable of reproducing itself. Um, all the parts that make up the structure can be printed off the machine and you can just then build it yourself using kind of off-the-shelf computer components. Uh, I built this machine in 2011, uh, so it's two years old now, and while it may not be the prettiest thing in the world, it is still kind of up to standard with uh, what the current, kind of the current market of printers are capable of doing. It just doesn't look as nice. Uh, the, the way it works is there's a, a filament here you'll see. Uh, it comes in a variety of colors and it comes in a couple different materials. Uh, the machine forces that filament down into that, that head there with the gear on it and it proceeds to then heat that plastic up to uh, about 410 degrees Fahrenheit, which puts it into a liquid form, and then it presses it down onto the build platform layer by layer, and it does that you know, hundreds and hundreds of times until it's built up a structure. Uh, the, in the case of this right now, the current layer height, uh, which is you know, each individual layer is 0.3 millimeters, and that number can be dropped down to 0.05 millimeters, and that seems to be about the maximum resolution of this type of machine. Um, what it's currently doing here is, you know, when you feed in the model into the printer, and the printer will then start printing out layers by la layer by layer, and it's building out the first, the first main layer of the print. Uh, it does it at a very slow pace, kind of just to so make sure it fuses real well to the, the print surface. Otherwise, as the print starts to cool as it builds up, that can kind of delaminate from the print surface and pop loose, and you've just lost a print. Um, the, you know, in the case of this print, which we're, we're building this right here, 
which is a sort of vase or cup. Um, that print takes about two and a half hours to produce. So you know, it's not a fast process by any means. Uh, I, I think a lot of the kind of misinformation brought out by the news and articles written about it is that you can print you know, anything you want real quick and you've got it. Um, that's not exactly true. You can print some stuff real quick, but for the most part, it takes a real long time to do that. A lot of these small models that are over here on the corner of the table, they took upwards of eight to 10 hours to print. Uh, and those aren't, they're, they're fairly hollow. So that gives you kind of an idea of you know, printing something at a higher resolution takes a long time to do. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of give you a, I'm gonna let, I'm going to let her talk about the kind of IP and copyright aspects of all this stuff because I really don't know that all, all that much about it. But um, I'm, I'm going to kind of explain the workflow, which will kind of tie into you know some of the issues that are related to this. Um, currently, you've got to be a, a fairly computer savvy person to operate one of these machines. Uh, the workflow for getting a model to print is not by any means simple. You have to run through. Was about uh, four programs in order to hit the, the stage that you're actually able to print to the machine. Uh, you start with your 3D modeling program, you develop your model how you want it. From that stage, once you've got it how you want, you send it off to another program that verifies that you can actually print this model. Um, and if it tells you no, then you've got to go back and start over again. Once you've got that done, you send it off to another program. That program then starts dividing it up into the each individual little slices so that you can have something to send to the printer, and then finally you send it through the printer's program, and it will actually start doing something. Uh, just think on that for a second. If you're the average person trying to print something, this isn't Windows. It isn't. You're not just hitting the print button and it ain't coming out. Um, it, it can be a nightmare a lot of the times. And you know, in my case, where I'm working with clients and trying to produce stuff, I have to go through that entire process before I can even tell them how much something's going to cost because it has to hit the printer stage to let me know, you know what the, the print time is going to be and therefore what the cost is going to be. So on the business aspect, it ain't great either because you've got to, uh, you've got to jump through a few hoops to get to there. All right, so that, that's kind of the workflow if you're, you're starting from scratch and developing your own model. Now, there are other means of getting models. Uh, one of the main websites available right now for 3D modeling is a site called Finiverse. Um, that is where people like myself go and uh, once we finish a model, we'll upload it and let people use it on the web free of charge. They can then go download it and they skip you know, a good chunk of that process and they can just send it directly off to the printer. Um, that's where you start to get into this there being a lot of copyright material out there. And, uh, in the case of the Yoda on the corner there, that, that's one of the most printed objects available out there. Um, just because it's, you know, it's an interesting model and it's, it also becomes kind of an educational piece at that point where you, you've built a machine or you've bought a machine and you want to see how the machine actually works so you go download this model here and then you can then print it out and see what you're kind of comparing to everyone else. So this is still... Even if you go out and buy the top one machine, there's no guarantee that thing's going to work right off the bat. Uh, this, their idea is they hope, you know, they hope that it will work that way, but in reality, it's going to break on the machine. Um, these companies are only producing, you know, a thousand printers and selling them, so they're not they're not getting out to a large enough scale to really be able to get all the bugs worked out of it. The kind of the third option for developing a model is uh, 3D scanning, which this is something that's now really just beginning to hit the market. Uh, it's, it's been out before for uh, kind of <coughs> more industrial fields, professional fields, um, but now it's starting to hit the consumer level. And there's a few aspects to 3D scanning. You know, it's, it's great on one hand, you, it's kind of like a photocopier for you know, whatever. The downside to it is it's only a photocopier of the kind of the external surface of the model. So, you know, I could scan this object right here. Um, it'll take a laser, it'll rotate this object around, and it'll grab all the surface of it, but it will miss, you know, the complete internals of it. So if you have a mechanical object or a 
an object that has you know, moving parts to it, you're not going to be able to get those moving parts because it, it just can't see them. And that, that's the main problem right now with, with 3D scanning. So you know, it's coming out, it's the next great thing, but in reality it's not going to be functional for quite some time until they can come up with a way to really duplicate objects. Alright, so let me, so that, that covers the kind of three, three methods for getting models. I'll kind of run you through the, the current market of printers. Uh, on the professional level, you've got the large scale machines that are using a, a powder based product that they, they use lasers to fuse together and you can pr produce a uh, extremely detailed, extremely high resolution product that uh, is very accurate to the dimensions that are fed to the printer. Um, these machines cost tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the size and scale of the machine. Um, and for the most part, they are not available to the public. They're held by aeronautics firms, large-scale businesses that have, you know, have the, the ability to purchase one of those machines and use it internally. But uh, the likelihood of you finding one available to the public is pretty difficult. Uh, the next sort of level is the prosumer level. Um, this level, it, it, it's just now starting to come to market. Uh, there's a company called Form Labs that have just introduced a printer. Uh, this printer uses a, a liquid resin and again uses lasers to cure the, le the resin and sort of builds it in the reverse way that this builds it. It builds it from, it builds it upside down and kind of lifts it out of the resin. Uh, like I said, this is just coming to the market. I believe they've only shipped 700 printers to date and it's been a year since they launched their company. Uh, they're cost-wise about you know three and a half to four thousand um, dollars. The benefit of it, though, is that you're getting the detail level, the quality that you get from the pro level. It's just a much smaller scale, so it's a scale comparable to this, but you get the the detail of the pro machine. And then finally, you've got the what I'll call kind of like a consumer level printer. Uh, that's you know pretty much what this is here. The kind of downside to it is it's low resolution, the build volume on it's fairly small. In the case of this machine, it's about six inches by six inches by six inches. So once you get larger than that, you have to either find somebody who's got the capability of printing a larger object, or you can attempt to slice up the object and divide it into printable sized chunks. The downside of that is you're then gotta take all those chunks, fuse them back together, and hope that it turned out the way you want it because you're going to be spending a lot of time printing a, a large-scale object. The you know, cost of a machine similar to this, I, I believe I spent roughly $600 building this machine. Um, realistically, it's probably closer to 1000 now. If you want to go out and buy a ready working machine, you're going to spend two to $3,000 on that machine. And the, again, you've got this ease of use problem average person, they're going to have a tough time spending that money. They're going to get out there, they're going to get this machine, they realize that it's extremely difficult to use. The materials, while they're not very expensive, you do have to order them from, you can't just go get them from Amazon or from your, your average, you can't go to Walmart and pick up a, a roll of filament. So you've got to order it from a specialty company. And there's just a lot of moving elements to, to getting to the stage where you can do something like that. Um, so that, that kind of, that brings us up to where we're at right now. Now, I'm gonna kind of just run through what I kind of foresee in the near future, uh, where this is going. Uh, you know, every day we see articles in the news that are showing there, there's new ways to use 3D printing, they're printing organs, they're printing prosthetics, they're sending printers off to third world countries to use so that they can produce parts and stuff that they can't get easily. Um, all that's great. Uh, the industrial end of it's going to kind of grow. It's just a matter of whether or not there's really this sort of, they're, they're hyping it up to be a consumer level product, but at this point I, I'm kind of wary to say that at any point in the you know, next 10 years, it's going to reach the stage where they've worked out all the bugs and it's actually going to be functional to a just a, a regular person. And then once they have the printer, are they actually going to be committed enough to use it? Um, like I said, it's, it's difficult to use and the stuff that you're printing from it just, 
you're, you're not getting the quality. And after two years of having this machine, the quality hasn't increased at all um, on the current market of machines. So it's kind of tough to say where you know, they could ever reach a stage where it's going to really produce something that's usable to the average person. Um, is there anything else for you guys? That's pretty much it. So, does anybody have any questions initially? It's, are, you, are you mainly limited because of the, it sounds like you, you're mainly limited because of the current software or, or models, so to speak, that are available. I mean, if somebody gave you a fantastic model, right. this machine would make it. It'll make it, but only to a certain extent. I mean, the, the resolution of the what you can output out of the model is limited by the type of machine. So the current market of consumer-level printers all are using this exact same technology of melting down the plastic, and it's just not a very exact process. It's limited. You're limited on your layer heights, um, which means you're then limited on your resolution. So. You know, if I try to print out an object that's got any sort of detail and it's less than an inch or two, kind of cubed, that's not going to, it's not going to carry over any of those details because you've got this little tiny nozzle that's, you know, it's I believe 0.35 millimeters. That can only carry so much detail as you're going around a corner, a, a corner of an object. So let's say you're printing a square, it's almost impossible to get a true sharp edge on a square. Um, and the same goes once you start getting into real uh, ornate objects. So at, at the current, you know, the current ways, we can, unless they come up with another technology that's both cost effective and has the has made it through kind of the easy use stages, you know, it's going to be difficult to reach a, a consumer market. I think. Um, what are the types of materials that you can put into it? I read a while ago that was talking about making surgical instruments, but you can't put metal in that. Now, um, this type of machine is capable of pretty much using plastic materials. It's uh, the current material in here right now is ABS, which is the same stuff they make Legos out of car bumpers. It's a, it's a pretty durable plastic. Um, you've also got uh, what's called PLA, which is a corn-based plastic. It's a little bit nicer when you're using it. You know, if you're using a printer inside your house or inside an office space, it uh, doesn't put off as many fumes, and the fumes that come off aren't as harmful. Um, you have nylon, which is extremely dangerous to use in the house because it does put off a lot of chemicals when it's heated up to the temperature necessary. <coughs> but those are pretty much the three uh, materials able you're able to use on this. Now, the larger scale machines that are, that are kind of professional level machines, those are capable of running a a, uh, a powdered metal. Um, that is not likely to ever make it into somebody's homes, I don't think, unless they've come up with another means of getting that metal out there because the powdered metal is fairly dangerous to operate with because it can combust. You know. So you don't, you don't want that happening in your home. If the thread is not too fine, can you print a, a bolt or a thread of opening inside Yes. Yeah, you can, uh, you, there are models available right now that can, uh, you can print a function nut and bolts, but you said the thread's got to be pretty, pretty beefy. Does, does this machine have the capability of replicating the plastic parts that are in this machine? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, when I first did this, my, my theory behind building this machine was I can pay for this machine by producing parts and then selling those parts off. The reality of that is it takes 15 hours to print off a set of parts um, to rebuild the machine. So, 15 hours of nonstop machine running or making this sound. Um, not exactly pleasant. I, I work. I work in this. You know, this is in my office with me when I work, and uh, I give it about four hours before I want to leave the room. <laughs> How are you finding demand for the, your custom printing services, and what are the kinds of items that that consumers or your customers tend to want to have printed? I get on an average week probably about six to eight calls from people interested in getting 3D printing, and it, like I said, we're the only people that, you know, you type in 3D printing Atlanta, we're the only ones that show up on Google for that result. So I get a lot of calls from people about it. Of those eight calls a week, I probably make, have one realistic job per month from it. 
So the demand, while well, it's there, I don't their their expectations of what you know cost is and what's capable of being done doesn't meet you know what their expectation mm -hmm. is a lot of the times. So the, the typical stuff that we end up printing off is um, props uh, for TV shows, for photo shoots. Um, we did we do logos for company events. You know somebody's doing corporate event, they want some sort of logo for a trophy or something, uh, something along those lines. We'll do something like that. Um, but so far I can't say we've only had one or two kind of just people, you know, general calls from non-companies that have led to a, an actual job. We've met with a lot of people, but, you know, most of the times they just don't, they don't understand the process enough to, for, to really meet their expectations once I put the job out for them. What's the sort of rough error rate of printing it? How sensitive is that machine to sort of environmental conditions and stuff? Uh, the biggest thing I found with it is uh, the room, the, kind of the ambient temperature of the room. Um, it's, you know, it's printing on a, a piece of glass right now that's sitting on top of what's called a heated bed. The, the bed itself is at, uh, I believe, if it's at 110, yeah, 110 degrees Celsius. Um, so it's hard to heat a, a sheet of copper to that temperature and keep it at that temperature. So what happens is this thing will be running, air conditioner will kick on, and then it'll start to drop down a few degrees. And then most times it'll manage to fight that back. But if the temperature drops too much, it'll delaminate or the print will start to separate. So that needs to be kept at a pretty decent temperature. What's the process of getting from the model to a rep? Uh, Duplicate um, copy. Did you scan that? Did you? Or, or you talked about the ways of getting um, the, the model there into you because you have to get it into your computer, right. Correct? correct? And so, do you use uh, scanning? Uh, for the most part, I'll either start from scratch and just build the model from scratch. Um, if the on your computer, yeah, on my computer, okay. I it from scratch. Um, I have yet to got get into 3D scanning anything just because it's just there's no. There, there's no way that me, whatever the needs are, that I have enough. You know, have a, you know, somebody needed to, to duplicate a, a, a solid object, for the most part, I could just do it manually without using a scanner. To follow up on the last question, you said there were four different file types that you need before you can actually begin. Four different, four different programs you've got to kind of work through. But don't they each create their own unique files? Um, yeah, so your 3D. You'll start with your 3D modeling program. From there, you'll output a, a STL file, which is kind of a generic 3D program file. You'll pull that into the slicing program. That will take that model, create the layers, and convert it into what's called G-code, which the printer can actually read. And then finally, send it off to the printer's kind of RIP software. Let's say you've got um, something special that you want to uh, share with a friend. Mm -hmm. Which file would you export? The, the, uh, the STL file. Yeah. The G code, the, the G code file is specific to the printer, so it encodes all the settings for the printer into that, so that right when that loads in, the printer knows what temperature it needs to be running at and what layer type and all that good stuff. Anybody else? But is the uh, just to follow up is that the STL file is created? Is that device independent? Yes. yes. Do you have to customize the program before you set it in to say I'm using a device with these parameters, so then it knows? No, the only what the real, limits are. The only real setting you need to take into account is making sure that wherever you're working on, it's been uh, designed in metric because all these machines run off of uh, millimeters. So you just need to make sure whatever you design's prepped for that, so that when it comes in, it's not scaling it out to you know, 500 inches instead of 500 millimeters. <laughs> Yeah, you can do that from AutoCAD and just about every other three <laughs> modeling program on the market. Excuse me, I'm not very savvy technologies. What's the fundamental advantage and the difference for 3D printing compared to the traditional manufacturing process? It's, um, it's speed, uh, mainly. I mean, uh, in my case, when I've had something I needed that I knew I couldn't guess immediately, you know, or it would be something I have to order online and wait a few days for 
I can produce that in a matter of you know an hour or two. So I, if you know in the case of um, in the case of these pieces right here, you know it's a fairly simple piece, and I could probably find this specific piece online. Um, it took me 30 minutes to put the model in, and within an hour I had this object printed out in a usable, you know, a usable level. So this was a, a piece for a car. Um, I printed out and basically in solid instead of having any sort of hollowness to it. Before the program, you were mentioning that various densities mm -hmm. how that impacts with speed and cost and so forth. Could you explain that? Sure. So there, there's a couple factors there. Um, You've got, you can set your density of what you want the print to come out as. Um, meaning that you can, once it gets going, it starts printing mesh inside the object, and you can increase or reduce that mesh depending on how kind of solid and usable you want the object to be. So if I was gonna have a part that needed to be actually used and work in the real world without deteriorating or breaking, I'd want to print it at a fairly solid level, so 80, 90% solid. Now, the downside of that is the additional, you know, additional lines that you're putting into the object takes additional time to do. So, in the case of a model like this, this is probably 20 or 30 percent dense. Um, it still took, you know, eight hours to print. So we increased that number to 60 percent, and you've just now, you know, doubled or tripled the amount of time it takes to print an object. And when you increase that amount of time, you're increasing your kind of your Likelihood of failure, likelihood of going some, something going wrong with the machine. You know, this the filament will get tangled up, or you know, power will flicker out, or you know, there, there's a million things. Your computer could freeze up and crash during that time. And once that happens, it's a lost print, and you've got to go back and start over again. So, the idea of something failing after eight hours that you've you've had to actually babysit for a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, when I'm doing a four or five hour print, I've got to stay fairly close to the office. Um, and check on it every 30 minutes or so to uh, make sure that it's not about to fail, hasn't failed, because you know, that all well, the costs, you're not losing any money because the, the cost of the print itself is you know, maybe 50 cents or a dollar. It's that, that time aspect that you're losing there. So as a business person, it doesn't work out very well to lose a print after four hours and have to start over again. And that happened the other day to me and it wasn't great. <laughs> David, you mentioned that the cost of printing something like that, I guess your materials cost would be 50 cents to a dollar. What would you, like let's take the car part for example, mm -hmm. what would you quote a client for printing something like that? So the, the material itself, uh, you buy this stuff by the pound, it's about $20 a pound, and that's roughly, I think it's 200 feet worth of plastic, and that 200 feet will go quite a long way to producing products. This used, um, I think about 12 feet. Um, so in the case of something like this, the way I kind of charge is based on the hour. Um, it might cost somebody 20 bucks, but the, the main part of the time goes towards me you know, creating the file and setting it off to the printer. So the print itself doesn't cost much to the, to the client. It's the, the preparation to get the print made. Have you had clients bring their own files to you? Yeah, occasionally we will. Um, if it's a, it's typically a, a company that's got somebody who does 3D modeling on hand and they'll send files off. And it simplifies a lot of that process. And then it's just a matter of setting up, making sure that it will print, and then setting it off to the machine. So their costs are fairly low, but uh, it's pretty rare to somebody that has something ready to go. What's the comparison between the print cost of that and buying the same article manufactured? If it's manufactured, more than likely it's going to be cheaper to buy it manufactured. Um, well, sorry, let me back up a little. Um, if you've got a machine, it's cheaper uh, to, to produce it off your own machine. Uh, it's, then you've got to get into the territory of, is the part need to be usable? Is it going to degrade over time? If it's going to degrade over time, is it worth, you know, is it worth it to print out eight of these so that you can replace them every once in a while um, versus going out and buying the part? And then it's just kind of, you know, is it worth it to go through the hassle of buying a part? But in a lot of times, you know, if it's a simple object, it, it makes a lot of sense to print it off of this. You know, the average person that doesn't have a machine, the, the cost benefit is not there for them. They could go out and buy it, and most of the times I'll refer them to do that. Is there some material, and do people use this in order to make molds? 
so that they could actually yeah. replicate ports quicker? Yeah, so you can make a mold from this stuff. It's not particularly great. The, the main problem is that it's not really high resolution to begin with. So if it's a mold that needs to have a lot of detail to it, you're going to you're going to get what you get from this. So you're either going to have to go back and clean up the product to the point where it's going to cl uh, create a clean mold, um, or you're going to run with it just the way it is. The other problem is that you have to be able to burn the material out of whatever the mold you're making is. Now, the, like I mentioned, the company Form Labs is print, uh, producing a kind of like a mid-range printer now that does extremely high quality stuff. Uh, those are being bought up a lot by jewelers now because they can they can produce a high quality part that also can be burned out. Um, but doing it from a machine like this, it's not particularly great. Is there any way to use wax? Um, you probably could, uh, but I haven't heard of a lot of people trying that. You can, I mean, you can burn this stuff out. It's just not a, a particularly clean burn. Just because it's an outsider, it seems it's not for two years now. I've offered it as a business service for a year now. In that year, you know, it hasn't generated a ton. It has generated a lot of confusing questions that I had to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so on my end, it's like, it's, it's great for me because um, I make things and I design things and I make things and it, it's wonderful. As a, looking at it from the outside, my, my, my parents have seen this thing in action. Um, they've talked to me about it, and they still don't have a clue of how it works. And <laughs> quite honestly, most people don't at this point understand how it works, and their expectations are completely based on what they've read in the in the media. And you know, they're thinking I'm printing guns off the thing and <laughs> printing <laughs> organs in my house, and it, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Anybody else? So, what do you think it's gonna? Are you still a believer long term? Believe yeah, I mean, it's. it's, it's Long term, it's a—I mean, it's a fantastic tool. It's—but it's a tool. It's no different than somebody that's got a, a CNC machine. Um, it's not going to change the world in the next in the near future. Yeah, I mean, it, like I said, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen before this can make it to a level where it's usable by the average person. What else? And turn it over to you. It's great to get David's perspective, which I had a little bit of a preview of from a phone conversation. It feels like every article that you read is touting 3D printing as the next industrial revolution. And if it's not here yet, it will be in the next three to five years. Two billion dollar market now, and by 2020 it'll be a 20 billion dollar, 25 billion dollar market. So it's it's a very interesting perspective, and I'm, I'm glad that you were able to be here today. So um, with that said, thank you all very much for being here, and um, the partner in my firm, Lisa Moore, did ask me to reiterate what Andrew said and express her sorrow sorrow for not being able to be here today. She did have a work emergency and um, brought me to deal for somebody. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the background of 3D printing and why I find it so fascinating. One of the questions that I've gotten, as I've let people know that I'll be, or I will be, will have been talking here today is, oh, do you represent a ton of clients who do 3D printing? And no. <laughs> but at this point, based on my research, it doesn't sound like really anyone does. Um, it's all really academic right now. Um, there may be clients out there like David who need agreements to protect their intellectual property rights and the designs that they're doing. Um, or like, the converse of that to protect the rights of the clients whose work that they're hired to do. Um, but outside of that, there's not a lot of IP work specifically devoted to 3D printing. So really it's how are the traditional tenets of IP and specifically for our purposes today, copyright law, going to lend themselves to a 3D printing landscape as it hopefully becomes more prevalent in the consumer market. Um, so interestingly, this technology has actually been around since the 1970s. Um, the first patent for this technology was granted in 1977. Um, but until recently, the cost of the printers and the 
the savvy and education and experience and it sounds like the patients needed <laughs> to use these machines um, have been serious bars to entry. Um, a couple of recent developments have, have started to change this. There's been a dramatic decrease in the price of the printers. Uh, when these first started to come out and were only on a consumer level, they were hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. As David mentioned recently, they, um, on the consumer version, they can be as, as cheap as $600 up to you know, $1,000 to $2,000. Um, and with the introduction of more user-friendly 3D scanning technology, and I want to make sure I'm clear about the difference between scanning technology and AutoCAD design technology, are very different technologies. Um, so consumer use may become more of a reality as people become more interested and more understanding of 3D scanning and how that plays into 3D printing possibilities. Um, we saw this first with Microsoft's Kinect gaming console. Um, when that first came out, oh great, another new you know, gaming console for, for our kids. But what people in the tech arena realized very quickly was that, that it is a 3D camera that can um, and many low-budget applications, including low-budget motion capture for animation and feature films and television, and as a tool in 3D printing. Um, with the right software, it can be modified to be a 3D scanner for 3D printing. Uh, the company behind Microsoft's Kinect 3D camera is actually getting ready to roll out a version of that 3D camera that's small enough to fit into an iPad. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens with that technology as it becomes more widely available and hopefully more user-friendly. Um, the company, excuse me, even Staples and Office Depot, as many of you may have heard or may have even experienced, now offer 3D printers in many of their brick-and-mortar locations. Um, I wasn't able to get anybody on the phone to tell me that, yes, this has actually been used in our store, so I don't know what those applications have been used for, um, but the possibilities are very interesting. The 3D printing market, as I mentioned, has the estimates for what it's worth right now vary widely. I've seen a $2 billion figure, I've seen a $7 billion figure, and it grows exponentially from there in the next, um, the next few years, so we'll see what happens. Um, the implications of 3D printing become more widely, becoming more widely available on a consumer and industrial or pro level um, are certainly very interesting, as I've said. Hobbyists um, who have these machines in their homes and have the technological savvy to use them can create jewelry, toys, replacement parts, tools, simple machines, and small furniture. Um, one very interesting article that I stumbled across in preparing for this panel was an article about the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, who is currently using 3D printing technology coupled with high-quality artwork prints to create exact replicas of Van Gogh works of art for sale at much cheaper prices than you would ever find an original Van Gogh work online. They're even creating replicas um, so exact to the extent that the back of the painting, the back of the um, canvas is recreated, the frame is recreated. This obviously has interesting implications um, for copyright purposes for other visual artists whose work would still be protected under copyright law, as well as fraud implications. <laughs> um, clearly. Um, so we'll see how that plays out, but it's an interesting application of this technology. It would certainly be great, um, as David mentioned, to have the ability to simply use your home printer to print off a replacement part for your dishwasher or your vacuum cleaner or um, whatever that piece is, the car part. <laughs> you don't know what that is, but how awesome that would be. Or to print out a new bug or a new dish or a new set of silverware instead of dealing with the hassle of struggling through Ikea on a Saturday afternoon, which I'm sure many of us um, some do say that this is where we're headed. We're certainly not there yet, but this is an optimistic projection, certainly. Um, and another sort of um, interesting perspective is that it will be a new industrial revolution as consumers not only control the speed which, which, with which these things can be re reproduced, but also the customization of these things. So let's say um, you know that you love this Yoda model and you thought of putting aside any copyright implications. You thought it was the coolest thing since sliced bread, but you wanted your Yoda to be wearing a hat. Um, you could, you know, assuming that you had the, the savvy to do it in your program, you could add a hat to your Yoda figure. Um, it would take you, you know, if you had the know how to do it, no wherewithal, um, however long it would require of your time in terms of modifying the program and print it out. Um, you could do the same thing with a cup, let's say that, or an action figure, let's say that you have a group of five year olds coming over um, for a birthday party and you wanted them all to have. 
um, an action figure with their face on it. Um, the technology is, is there. Um, maybe not everybody can use it, but it is there. Um, the level of detail in this machine might not be able to accomplish that, but on the consumer grade machines it is certainly um, possible. So that brings us to an interesting point with respect to these industrial revolution claims. Um, if you sort of suss through all of the, the hype and the, um, the puffery that's going on in these articles, one of the things that you'll get down to is that a lot of it has to do with the ability to rapid prototype, which is what these machines were originally created for, and to control the level of customization, and that those customizations may no longer be coming at a premium in terms of price as they once did. So take the example of buying a car. We're all very familiar with this. You buy a base model of a car for $25,000. It doesn't include any of the extras or bonus features um, that may otherwise be available. But let's say that you then start adding things like Bluetooth capability, power windows, heated seats, um, leather seats, things of that nature that um, are not necessarily included in the basic model. Um, those are all customizations. And as we all know, in our current um, manufacturing procedures, we have to pay extra for those customizations. This technology may turn that on its head, which is a really interesting implication. Um, there are other broad implications. Research is currently underway for the use of chemical inks or chemical materials in 3D printers, um, which would potentially enable those with access to these materials and to the machines um, to produce limited batches of aspirin, antihistamines, and acids, vaccines, etc. which the, the amazing ability to do that in third world countries could not be understated. Obviously, they would have to get the machines there first. Um, of course, in the wrong hands, this technology could be disastrous. And um, you mentioned gun parts. Um, there are, there is the capability right now to produce plastic parts for guns. Um, there was a student, I think, at UT Austin, who came up with this. And as soon as he realized that he could do this and actually replace, um, I guess, it's metal um, gun part with his recreated plastic gun part and make a firing assault weapon. He decided, this is great, I'm going to put it open source online for anybody that wants these plans to use. Um, so there's a gun control issue right there. Um, there's currently, until December of 2013, there's legislation in place that would um, prohibit somebody from actually acquiring, purchasing one of these guns, selling one of these guns, um, because they're undetectable. It's called the Undetectable Firearms Act. But it expires in 2013. Um, there are a couple of senators who are hoping to um, push forward, um, the push back the deadline for when uh, that the expiration uh, will will happen, but we don't really know at this point. We've, there's plenty of other stuff that Congress is focused on right now, so we'll see what happens with that. So with that very broad overview, um, where does copyright fit in um, into the scheme of things? In 2011, the website uh, that David mentioned called Thingiverse, which is based on an open source platform, and you guys may have also heard of a website called Shapeways, which is not open source. Um, it's very similar to a print-on-demand t-shirt company, just with different materials. So let's say I design a piece of jewelry that I think is beautiful, and I want everybody to have access to it, but they have to pay me if they want access to it. So on Shapeways, I would upload my file, and then if my boss decided, oh, I, I love that bracelet, and I'm going to go on Shapeways and buy one, Shapeways would actually fulfill that order, so I don't have to have a printer in my home and be running these things off on demand. Um, Shapeways prints it for me, and then we split the proceeds. Thingiverse is, is a completely separate model. Everything's open source. Um, so if I loved my jewelry design and wanted to make it widely available for everyone, no money changing hands, that's where I would go. So 2011, Thingiverse received the first ever takedown notice under the DMCA um, for something that was able to be replicated on a 3D printer. The subject of the, the notice was a file for the, a model of an optical illusion created in 1934 and used frequently by the artist M.C. Escher. Um, the model is called the Penrose Triangle. Um, ultimately, the notice was retracted due to the outcry of the Thingiverse community. Um, this designer decided to take it down and allow for licensing of the model under the Creative Commons license. Um, but it raised some interesting questions regarding the extent of copyright protection in these files and the models that can be created for them. So often, as a copyright practitioner, when we hear about an infringement claim, especially if we're on the defense side, our minds immediately go to, was it a fair use? 
how do those four factors apply? Well, interestingly, in the 3D printing context, the primary question seems to be, is there even copyright protection in the first place? So one argument was that the Penrose Triangle would not have been protected by copyright at all, as it was simply an expression of an optical phenomenon previously discovered in the 1930s and not an original expression of an idea. So since this first takedown notice two years ago, there have been many more, including for Game of Thrones themed iPod docs, movie props and character replicas, Yoda. <laughs> the number will likely increase given the types of content available. Um, and interestingly, the Star Wars themed goods are far and away the most popular um, on Thingiverse and Shapeways, which is very interesting given that, um, given that Lucasfilms um, has never gone after anybody subject to a take on notice. So I don't know if at this point they're you know, thinking probably these people are, are true fans. Let's <laughs> let it lie. <laughs> um, so I see David crossing his fingers. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, so again, the Penrose Triangle notice began an interesting dialogue about copyright and 3D, 3D printing that had been simmer, simmering at a low level for some time. So while theoretically the real objects and design files created in 3D printing are of course protectable by copyrights as sculptural works, technical drawings, models, um, or diagrams respectively, the traditional limitations on copyright protection will certainly still apply. Um, despite this interesting new medium. Uh, the primary question, of course, will be whether the works will be subject to copyright protection at all. So let's talk first about the idea expression dichotomy and the merger doctrine. As we all know, as copyright practitioners, there's no protection for an idea in the abstract. There is only protection for your original expression of that idea. This limitation prevents any creator from gaining a monopoly over an idea with a finite number of original expressions. In this case, um, the idea and the expression have merged. In the 3D printing context, if an image file of an object that exists in the real world is the only practical way to digitally represent that object, extending copyright protection to that image file would give its creator a stranglehold over that real object, which flies in the face of the encouragement of creation policy underpinning copyright laws in the United States. So even in the 3D context, copyright protection in a functional, in a functional work is absent or is limited to thin copyright at best. Um, functional protection is the province of patents, as we all know. <coughs> Similarly, where an ornamental object in incorporates utilitarian aspects, copyright protection does not extend to these utilitarian aspects of the object. Only where ornamental features can be identified separately from and are capable of existing independently of the utility of that object will copyright protection attach and then only to those ornamental features that are conceptually um, separable from the, as, from the useful article. So to give you an example, um, I'm sure many of you are well aware of this doctrine, but if a useful article such as a table, a chair, or a belt buckle um, has independent aesthetic features that don't serve the utilitarian function of the piece, those independent aesthetic features can be protected by copyright. So how does this apply um, to the 3D printing context? Uh, the easiest examples are obviously the purely artistic examples. Don't forget we're dealing not only with the file itself that was either created in an AutoCAD or similar 3D program, or that was created using a 3D scanner to scan an existing physical object. And we're also dealing with the reproduced object created from that file by the printer. If the origin of the file was a physical object created by an artist and it's a purely creative work like a sculpture, the analysis is the same as for any sculptural work and the original artist owns the copyright in the work. Any file later created from that object, as well as any physical object printed from that file, would be derivatives or reproductions of the original work and would need to be licensed if created by a third party. If the first iteration of the work was a file created in design software, meaning there was no physical object that was scanned in somewhere, the copyright is owned by the designer. <coughs> For functional objects, a separability analysis would apply to a design file created using a CAD type software. Take the design of a new type of screw or a gear or a nut and bolt, for example, putting aside path considerations completely. If the 3D file is the only way to visually, virtually represent this functional object, the chances of copyright protection attaching are slim, and again, any protection would be thin copyright protection. For functional objects, 
first existing in the real world and turned into a digital file using a 3D printer, there's an interesting case um, out of the Southern District of New York, New York from 2010 called Meshworks Inc. v. Toyota Motor Sales that found that such scans are merely reproductions of existing functional objects and are not sufficiently